Well, I arrived at the MBL in the fall of 1980. And I arrived in the MBL because of, at that time, Paul Gross was the director of the MBL, and I was the chairman of the school committee in this town. Those two things don't kind of go together. But as, uh, as happenstance would have it, Paul Gross's wife, Mona Gross, fabulous woman, became the assistant to the superintendent of schools. And uh, we got friendly. Uh, Mona said to me one day, what are you going to do? You're going to sit on the beach all summer, you know, uh, at the Yacht Club and not do anything other than school committee? And I said, uh, and she said, there happens to be an opening down at the MBL. You should apply for a job in the library. And I said, me? In the library? Are you crazy? I mean, look at me, hear me, I'm loud, blah, blah, blah. She said, try it. It's a different kind of library. It's not your idea of a library. And I had majored in psychology and minded in biology, so she knew I had a background in that. So I came down and I got the job and uh, with Jane Fessenden. And Jane was the director at the time. She was amazing. <clears throat> She understood exactly what the scientists wanted. In those days, 1980, remember, everything is still in paper. She said, no matter what we do, all they want <laughs> is to have the journal when they need it. And if journals are coming in every day, they come in early, they come up to the library around 7, 7.30, they look at the journals that are current, they go off to work, and they come back down late in the afternoon for a break and they read what's in the reading room. If they're doing a paper or submitting a grant, then they, of course, go into the stacks and find everything. In those days, as today, the library has everything available to you 24 hours a day. We never locked anything in those days. Now, of course, we have locks on the door, but we didn't lock anything in those days. <clears throat> so the scientists, never felt that they needed to take things out of the library. They could always go back to the library and always find it there. And so um, that was the first lesson you learned. Always make sure you have stuff for the scientists. No, nope, not in a million years. You see, my sister, my older sister, went to Simmons College and she became a librarian. And I thought that that had to be the worst job in the whole world, being a librarian. And she was an, um, a librarian over at RISD, which is the Rhode Island School of Devo Design. And she used to talk about how the head of the library used to sit them all down and they would peel apples at break time and talk. And I thought, oh my God, this is the worst job in the whole world. And so I was really kind of reluctant when Mona kept saying to me, no, 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 this is entirely different. And so and it was. It was entirely different and lots of fun and very exciting. Everything. Everything. It changed every day. You know, it was a job that you get up and you were happy to go to. Uh, the people were always nice. They're, um, and, and, and you're there for a purpose. You know, um, it's not that you're there to make any money, which is for sure. You are there, um, I always said, you know, when you drive through Woods Hole at night, you know, the lights are on in their lab. They're so dedicated, and if they can be that dedicated, you know, I can do what I need to do to, to support their science. Um, and they, you know, they were always going to cure cancer, or they were going to, you know, cure this or cure that, or make a great big breakthrough, which they have. I mean, they really have, and I always felt that the library was a part of that. I decided, <clears throat> probably only after being there for six months, that it would be a good idea. Computers were just starting to come into the libraries at that point, and all they were doing, and, and they, they completely missed the boat, even though that they were on top of the world with being the first major um, 
discipline to embrace computing power, they basically took the computer catalog and digitized it. it. They didn't give it anything else to do. You could go and you'd take a card and you'd look at what it was, or you could look at online and it was the same thing it gave back to you. They didn't give you anything else. But anyway, I decided I should probably go back to school and get a degree in uh, information systems, uh, which in those days was still called library science, but you could major in computer science and I was lucky because I didn't have to take, as I always say, those humanities kind of things. I didn't have to do that because I focused on medicine and science and the resources that they were there. And I know I do that when I talk about the humanities and everybody yells at me, but I was focused on making sure that I knew all the resources that there were in science and in medicine. Jane had sent me down to Washington to the National Library of Medicine to learn how to um, search on the database uh, Medline. And you, you actually had to go to school for a week to learn how to search on Medline. I, I know it sounds crazy nowadays, but you learned how to search. And we always tell the story of uh, uh, showing Homer Smith, who was the uh, general manager of the MBL, uh, what this Medline could do. I mean, we had a Silent 700, which basically is a, a terminal that when you put something in, uh, it, the paper would come up from behind. It was crazy. And you would put in, you know, like uh, a blonde, blue-eyed, uh, anemic and see if there was any relationship and it would go back to NLM and it would come back and it would say 700 postings, PTSG, I never forget it. Um, and you could print it. Now you didn't want to ever print that because you'd have too much, but you could, you know, print a shot, title abstract, title author and abstract. And I'll never forget Homer, Homer Smith watching this thing coming back and it was going really fast like this, you know, those old, and he looked at it and he said, wow, that typist in Washington can really type fast. Ah, <laughs> huh? cool. So the concept of, you know, computers still hadn't grabbed hold of the whole, you know, the whole place. Anyway, um, how has it changed? Well, that was kind of the beginning. And, and what I found was that I could actually write grants and get money for you know, automation and things like that. So I wrote a grant uh, to it then. It was called Title III. It was a state federal grant and I got a couple of million dollars. And um, it wasn't just to do the MBL. I had to do the entire CAPE to put it on a network and computerize their records. Uh, so what you had was like 15 small public libraries and the MBL. You know, the MBL, uh, when we did serials, we did 5,000 serials and created records and tools. And all of the public libraries combined did 100. I mean, so it was an economy of scale. I wrote the grant and did everything so that we could get all of the automation in place. And we ran the system for them. Uh, for quite a while. A, a grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the library got a uh, million dollars out of that and the lab got three million for uh, supporting the courses and we got a million. And I was in charge of that grant and I'll never forget it. People would come in and they'd say to me, this is 1986 I think, they'd come in and they'd say to me, I want to buy this journal and buy all these books and I'd say, I don't think we can do that. Well, you've got a billion dollars. I said, yeah, but I'm building a network. And no one could understand, you know, building a network to get ready for the digitization that was coming. We knew it was coming down the road. We got, um, get a lot of money from the uh, Mellon Foundation to create something called UBIO, which was a universal biological indexer and organizer. Now, I know you talked to David Remsen, but David had begun to work for me, and he was creating websites. We had um, Gopher for a while, and then as soon as 
you could create a website. David was like the creating one. And we were the first to put something up visually. We, we scanned all of the Leukart charts. We put them up and online and it got on the front page of Science magazine. And actually the title was Biologists Way Behind in Computing, you know, because biologists hadn't quite made the leap. They were, they did, and I, they jumped in feet first a few years later. David <clears throat> got a call one day saying, how come you people don't have anything on bluefish, Pomatoma saltator? And David said, what do you mean? We've got thousands of things on bluefish. I mean, you know, we live in bluefish heaven here in Woods Hole. And the name of bluefish had changed. It wasn't Pomatoma saltator anymore, it was Pomatoma saltatrix. And he was dumbfounded because everything was hardwired in. It was hardwired in you, it didn't send you back to all the old literature. It didn't send you back to all the old names of what that was. So he said, we need to build uh, an index that would have in it all of the pharma names of bluefish, Pomatoma saltator, saltatrix, uh, you know, all, everything that it was called. And it had like 17 different scientific names and quite a few uh, common names. We did go to Mellon and it was the aha moment, I'll never forget it. We were uh, presenting our case to the uh, big deals down at the Mellon Foundation. And um, David started talking about bluefish, Pomatoma saltator, and he said, someone was here just recently from your foundation and uh, we showed them that JSTOR, which they had funded, Mellon, that if you looked for uh, Pomatoma saltator, uh, and JSTOR has all the older literature, that you wouldn't find anything because that was the new name. And what you need is a system that would take all those names and search through it and, and give you back your names. And they, would, they were dumbfounded. They were like, oh yeah, yeah, we definitely need that. That's something we really need. The Biodiversity Heritage Library uh, came about, uh, there was a meeting over in England that we attended and it was called uh, Libraries and Laboratories. And it was, what, what do you need? What do you need from the library to support your lab? And at the time, they basically were talking about uh, what it would cost, because these were, this was the American, uh, this was the British Natural History Museum. And it was mostly the Natural History Museum people there. But we got involved with the museum people because of this project that we were in. I mean, they're the ones that use the names. So, and they're the ones that have all the taxonomists, which there aren't very many left, so they're all in museums. So we, uh, we were at the meeting, and I remember Jesse Osibal from the Sloan Foundation got up and said, what would it take to scan all the books in taxonomy? And people were, you know, back of the, well, they're probably only truly in the, in the field of taxonomy, zoology, for names and things like that, probably only 10 million books. And you know, and he went to, 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 well, at, you know, $3 a book, blah, 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 it'll cost X amount of dollars to do it. He said, we probably could do that. <laughs> Informatics course is 23 years old here. That's not long in the history of the courses, but for, um, for a discipline, medical informatics isn't that old, okay? So what you have here is like the history of medical informatics. If you look through the, uh, the faculty that started in medical informatics, um, they were the luminaries that started the whole field, like Homer Warner. Uh, he just recently passed away, and he was the uh, course director the first three years here. And if you read anything about Homer Warner, it's like he was a pioneer in medical informatics. Don Limbert, pioneer in medical informatics. You know, Don Macy's pioneer in informatics. I mean, th these, 
these people come here, they know that this is the kind of place that would um, bring success to a course. Don, who um, is at the National Library of Medicine and they sponsor the course here, he always said that he tried, <laughs> he tried to have this kind of course uh, at like a, you know, a medical meetings. And he said, I was always competing with, you know, the docs coming to something to get a CME and then they'd go and play golf. He said, and like, it was something new, you couldn't get them interested. He said, it wasn't until we came up with the idea of doing 15 doctors and 15 librarians, medical librarians, and putting them together. Um, and that way, in those days, remember, the docs, I didn't even know what a mouse was. I mean, they were, you know, they could operate on you, but they were not involved in any kind of information gathering or seeking. You know, they would always ask somebody to do it for them. And, and using computers to get good health outcomes was just starting to be an idea. But the Encyclopedia of Life uh, was a grant that, you know, the, the MBL, we, we wrote it at the MBL and, and the Smithsonian and Chicago Museum and Harvard and the British Natural History Museum. And those were kind of the five founding blocks of granite for uh, uh, the Encyclopedia of Life. And I thought that the, and part of the Encyclopedia of Life which was going to create a page for every species, uh, the underpinning of the information, the literature would come from the digitization that we would be doing for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And at that time, I thought that what we were bringing to the table, and this is why we were involved with the museum, is that we were bringing the software. We were bringing this UBIO software to them so that this would underpin the information. Uh, the names changes and all of that. And when we started to look at the collections that people had, guess what? The MBL, of course, had this incredible collection of science going back to the 1700s, better than some of the museums. Did I say that? But better than some of the museums. It's the heart of the institution. <laughs> well, you know, you're only as good as the information that you have. And in order to get science done, there's no question, you have to go to the literature. The literature in print, the literature in uh, digital format, you have to have access to that. And the library has always been the place that has given you access. They've had spectacular collections. They've had, if a new research front came in, if they hired a new group that were doing something that we didn't have anything in, biophysics, you know, you would have to go and support the biophysics that was going on on a year-round basis. Uh, and, and I think that that is still the role of the library. You have to support the research that's being done at the lab, and you have to support it at a level that they expect. You have to maintain a collection that satisfies the research that's going on in your place. And that continues to this day, whether it's in print, whether it's by fax, whether it's digitally delivered to you, that's what happens. And I think that, you know, over the years we've done that. We've, we've brought them instant gratification. You're a scientist. You constantly want to keep up. Scientists don't retire. I mean, I, I, they just don't retire. They want to keep up in their field. And the best way to do that is to keeping up with the literature. And that's why they come into the library. That, that becomes a place for them to come. But they're very involved, want to stay involved in what is going on at the MBL because it's always leading edge. Um, the courses keep it leading edge. The lectures keep it leading edge. It's a good place to be. You know, everybody is the same there in Woods Hole. It's hard to, you know, be, you know, have this reverence for the head of a department when he's standing there in a bathing suit. 
you know? You're all the same. You've all just been swimming, you're all just back in the library, and you have this easy conversation uh, going to the, the dining hall, you have these conversations. It's just a pretty miraculous place to be for scientists.